Good morning and welcome to our worship here at the Common Old Church of Christ. Welcome to those joining us on Zoom and on Truth FM. And uh, we have a special visitor, a guest who's traveled all the way from Ukraine just to worship with us today and a lot more other reasons as well. So we're glad that you could be with us today and I hope you take the opportunity to welcome her. And your name again is Kurt? Hannah. Go with us today and have a ball. I'll remind everyone that you no longer have to wear your face masks during worship if you prefer, though we would ask that you do put them back on when we're singing just to limit the amount of spread of any potential germs and such like. Uh, our opening prayer this morning will be from our brother Edmund. Our prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you for giving us this opportunity where we can come together and worship you in truth and in spirit. Father, we pray for our brothers who are leading us in worship this morning, that you be with them. And we pray for us. Father, whatever is said, we're able to... We pray for all those who couldn't be with us this morning to worship with us, that whatever reasons they may have, that you be with them and be a comfort to them. We pray that our worship to you this morning is acceptable. Through your son's name we pray. Amen. Come on, everyone. Oh, definitely now. Uh, as Graham says, uh, we have to wear our face masks for, for singing, particularly as I've picked songs which I would class as being like rock anthems of the church, so ones that you really do need to belt out. I don't mention football anthems anymore, I'm done with football. So uh, we're going to start off with singing number 144, Oh Worship the King. So if we can stand for this. The songs that I've picked this morning uh, have all kind of tried to focus on the, the regal nature and uh, the authority or the the adoration that we should have for God. So let's sing 144. Oh, worship the King, all oh, glorious above and great. His Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Second Kings, starting from chapter 25, starting from verse 18. Sorry, my eyes aren't doing me good today. And the captain of the guard took Sariah, the chief priest, and Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three keepers of the threshold. And from the city, he took an officer who had been in command of the men of war and five men of the king's council who were found in the city. 
and the secretary of the command of the army who mustered the people of the land and 60 men of the people of the land who were found in the city and Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon at Ribla. And the king of Babylon struck them down and put them to death at Ribla in the land of Hamath. So Judah was taken into exile out of its land. Good morning. Today's New Testament reading is going to be Revelation 11, chapter, Revelation 11, verse 19. I'll be reading from the CSB. So that's Revelation 11, verse 19. <clears throat> then the temple of God in heaven was opened, and the Ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder, an earthquake, and severe hail. The next song this morning will be song 147, 147, I Stand Amazed. So as the song title suggests, uh, we're going to be standing again if you're able. I think virtually four out of six songs all suggest standing. So we'll be getting our uh, up and down uh, exercise today. So I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see. T'will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Please be seated. Morning. <clears throat> Let's pray. 
Father, we're grateful for all that you do for us. And we're so thankful for it. We bring before you this morning, Father, our brother Paolo. He works tirelessly and selflessly for you, Father. And we ask at this time that you be with him, Father, so that he may feel your presence and your love for him in everything that he does. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our next song will be song 332, Lead Me to Calvary. We'll remain seated for this one. Now, this song, uh, over the years that I've came to this church, I've heard all different varieties of tempo. So uh, I'm afraid I'm in charge. You've got to go at my speed for this one. So hopefully we'll finish at the same time. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me. Lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast laid, tenderly mourned and wept. Angels in robes of light arrayed, guarded thee whilst thou slept. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Let me like Mary through the gloom Come with a gift to thee. Show to me now the empty tomb. Lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget thine agony. Lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee. Even thy cup of grief to share, Thou hast borne all for me. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Good morning. <clears throat> At the start, everything was perfect. There was just one guy and his wife, and they lived in the garden that their God 
had made for them. In the evenings, they could walk in the garden and they could talk, they could chat with God. Everything was perfect, total harmony. But it didn't last for long. Satan got to work and the result was that God kicked out the man and his wife out of the garden. Genesis uh, 3, 23 and 24 tells us, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. That was separation from God. Perhaps this was the first example of spiritual death that we have in scripture. Shortly, it's followed by the record of the first physical death. That was Cain killing his brother, Abel. All of these events are covered in Genesis chapters three and four. But it keeps going on. God got so sick of man's conduct that he decided eventually to have a pretty full clear out. And that was the flood recorded in Genesis 5 to 9. It really should have improved then, shouldn't it? After the flood, everyone spoke the same language. That was Noah's language. But by the time we get to Genesis 11, again, God was getting so fed up with them that he confused their languages to try and hold them back. Later, God chose Abraham and made a special promise to him, the promise of a son and an heir. Then, of course, along comes the issue of Sodom and Gomorrah, the twin cities of evil, of sin, Genesis 18 and 19. And Genesis comes to a close with God bringing his family to Egypt. But notice that there's been kind of strife all the way along. Following this, we get Moses, Joshua, then judges and kings, prophets sent by God to try to keep the people sticking to the rules and, and being faithful to him. Assyrians. Babylonians. Time and time again, God using all the techniques he can to keep his people faithful. But always it only seems to last for a short time and then back into trouble again, back into sin. So eventually, what else can God do? Everything he tries seems to fail, and that's all because of the sinfulness of mankind. So he puts into plan a place that we, as mere human beings, can hardly countenance. The most extreme action that anyone could countenance. And that is that God put his only son, the perfect and sinless Jesus, into the frame. And finally, he subjected him to the worst possible treatment, the worst possible trauma, and the most awful death imaginable. There's no wonder that Hebrews 9 and 26 says of Jesus, he has appeared once for all to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And this is the Jesus that we're here to remember today. It's not simply to recall his death at the hands of the Romans, at the behest of the Jews, certainly, but to recall his resurrection from the dead, his victory over sin, his ascension to the heavens to sit at the right hand of his majesty on high, almighty God, our creator and redeemer. All of that was done for each one of us. For anyone who would submit to the call of Jesus and will remain faithful to him. And it's for this reason that we honor our Savior this morning, to acknowledge his power, his glory, his majesty, 
and to acknowledge and state our commitment to him. Our Father, having tried throughout time in every possible way to redeem his people, has finally, once for all, given his Son to pay the price of sin on your behalf and on my behalf. I'd like to read a few passages from the uh, Gospel of Luke. Um, going to begin in Luke 22, and verse 14. <clears throat> I can get there. <clears throat> Luke 22, 14. And when the hour came, he sat at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you that I shall not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and, said, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after supper, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And then in chapter 23, reading from verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. Other versions say, This man was the Son of God. Chapter 24, verses 1 to 9. <clears throat> but on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices which they had prepared. And they found the ro stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to eleven and to all the rest. And finally, the same chapter, verses 44 to 47. Then he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the, is the um, Savior whom we remember today, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us give thanks now for the bread. Could you bow with me, please? Our Father, we thank you for the symbol which Jesus gave us, the bread, to represent his body, that our minds might be drawn to the understanding of the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. As we take this bread, Father, may we remember the sacrifice of Jesus, and may we commit our bodies to his service. In Jesus' name, amen.
give thanks now for the fruit of the vine. Our Father, in the fruit of the vine, we see the symbol of Jesus' blood shed to pay the price of the sin of each one of us today. We thank you for the memory of Jesus' death, but more so of his resurrection and of the knowledge that he now sits at your right hand, victorious over sin. Father, we know that through Jesus' blood, we too can be victorious over sin. Bless this memory, this fruit of the vine to each one. In Jesus' name, amen. Next song will be song 452, 452, Standing in the Promises. When I pick my songs, I usually, after the Lord's Supper, pick a song at the Krishna Assurance uh, section of the book. Uh, as we go through our lives, we're usually subject to attack. It can be from friends, from family, from the media. But these types of songs are the kind of ones that you can uh, get inspiration and encouragement by thinking on their words. So let's stand for song 452. Standing on the promises of Christ, my King, through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Saviour, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promise of God. <coughs> standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call, 
Resting in my Saviour as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Saviour. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Please be seated. Good morning. Sermon reading this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 6 through 9. That's the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 6 through 9. And they read, But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. And every second ago. Good to see everyone. It's good to be able to preach without my mask. This is my first time without my mask for two and a half years. So that's great. Good to see everyone out uh, this morning. We've got a few missing. I think Johnson's away on holiday. I think I think Aireen is Aireen away. Aireen's away, and we've got a few that are sick, headaches and stomach aches and colds and, and that sort of thing. Good to see Daniel this morning. You're looking a year older there, brother their birthday last week. Good to see him. Especially good to have Hannah with us from the Ukraine. So make sure you meet her uh, at the end. She's, she says her English isn't very good, but it's actually very good, but you'll see her straining to listen. So slow down to about 50%. Polina, slow down to about 25%. <laughs> and don't laugh when you're talking. All right, and you'll go on just fine. The, her Majesty's prison in Wellingborough. There you go. In 2000, the year 2000 started uh, a community program where serious drug offenders that were identified as suitable by the prison authorities would give talks to school children and groups of children about the dangers of doing drugs. Uh, and uh, I think the program was called Drugs and Crime Means Doing Time. And uh, since the year 2000, and also other prisoners would even go out to the schools and other, other children's groups and give those talks. And uh, in that time, since 2000, they've spoken to, I think it was 375 groups of children, 4,000 4, children in total, 500 teachers and 55 support workers. And they're telling those children what not to do, what not to, the, not to make the same mistakes they made in life, the things not to do, well, they should know because they made those mistakes. So they should be able to tell them. They should be able to give them good advice. I think that's fair enough. I, th I think we could probably all give some expert advice on things not to do based on the mistakes that we've made. Dwight Harris is similar, but uh, slightly worded slightly different. Dwight Harris was sent to prison when he was 18 years old. He was sentenced to 25 years for assault with intent to murder from Detroit, Michigan. When he got back out of prison, he's now 53. When he gets back out of prison, he headed back to Detroit and just six months ago, actually, in December last year, he set up his own non-profit organization called Icon 10. And that was to help prisoners who were coming out of prison and wanted to merge back into society, and he helps them do that. Well, that's fair enough, because he has the expertise for that. What might be slightly more eyebrow-raising is that six years ago, He'd been out of prison for four years. So six years ago, 
he actually, in two separate areas of Detroit, Michigan, set up a, a mentoring program where he could mentor young people. He could be a mentor to the young people. The news program that you see, the, their, I don't know if their logo's on there, but you can tell it's a news program. The news reader said he is giving children the support they need to build towards a positive life. Well, is he qualified for that, you might ask? He's not really experienced much of a positive life himself. How is he able to pass that on? Kate, in the comments, she certainly didn't think so. She said, I wouldn't let kids anywhere near that guy. She wasn't convinced. Well, the question is, I guess, do you have to get it just right yourself? before you know what to say. Gaza. David's given up on football. Emma will be glad to hear. I'm not sure she's convinced, but Gaza apparently is uh, giving advice to his son about how to live. If you don't know Gaza, Paul Gascoigne, as a footballer, he was a genius. As a father and a husband and a man, he was a complete failure. But he's giving his son advice on how to live. Now, apparently, his son didn't listen. Who can blame him, you might say? Can we call Gaza a hypocrite? for giving someone the same advice that he himself wouldn't take. There must be a name for that. Thank you, Graham. Oh, in fact, I think, yeah, I think that's okay. One more, right. There must be a name for that. Um, a name for when you are giving people instructions or advice that you're really not very good at yourself. You've not, you've not, grasped or you've not become proficient at it yourself i don't know if there is a name i'm going to call it the selden principle in 1654 john selden 1654 that's a long time ago john selden printed a book called table talk and in that book he coined the phrase for the first time apparently first person to ever say it do as i say not as I do. We've all heard that. Parents have been saying it ever since, since 1654. Do as I say, not as I do. Well, apparently he was the first one to say it. Ironically, a wee bit embarrassed about this. Ironically, he wrote that phrase in a chapter about preaching. And he, he designated it to preachers. Pre and, and his, I'm going to change it a little bit. His, his, kind of um, direction was, preachers are always saying, do as I say, not as I do. Well, how am I supposed to do it if they're not, how am I supposed to trust them to do it if they're not doing it themselves? So he wasn't very happy about it. I'm going to change it a wee bit this morning. I'm going to change it to preachers among, probably all of us, at times have to say, do as I say not as I do. If Graham and I or any of the men here that get up and preach only got up and preached on the things that they were proficient in, the things that they'd got a handle on, the things that they were perfect in, guess what? You'd hear the same one or two lessons all the time. There'd be a lot of subjects not covered, am I right? So I am playing the John Selden, I'm playing the Selden, what do I call it? The Selden Principle. I am playing the Selden principle card right now so that I can avoid anyone saying on this subject, yeah, that's fine, Graham, thanks. On this subject, God's grand design, if you can't tell from the scripture reading that Brian read, it, it's about marriage. If you're not married, don't worry. If you've been married and you're not anymore, don't worry. If there's no prospects of marriage, don't worry, because you can apply most of these things to any relationship, all right? But it's about marriage. That's the subject I was given. 
from this week's devotional group. Well, I'm playing the Selden principle card before anyone says, what does he know? Is he even qualified to talk about marriage as a good husband? Before anyone calls me a hypocrite, because I'm not very good on the subject. I would say, as I'm sure Melanie will tell you, but she's too kind, she won't tell you. Unless you're close enough, then she might tell you. I wouldn't call myself maybe as big a failure as Gaza on that subject, but not done very well. So I'm playing the Selden card. Brian, thank you for reading that. Keep a marker in John, eh, sorry, John, keep a marker in Mark 10, because we will be flipping between Mark 10 and Genesis 2 uh, for most of the lesson. So as far as marriage goes, I've done plenty of the harmful things. And I've neglected most of the good things. Yeah, yeah, Mike, you don't know me. I'm certainly by giving this lesson, not claiming to be a role model for marriage, for a perfect marriage or good marriage or whatever it might be. But I do know what he says about it because he told us. And I do know what's possible for marriage because he's proved it. And I do know what his design for marriage is. Not because I've got a grasp on it, but just because he's revealed it in words and in actions. And because I'm not an expert in it, I'm just going to give it to you. I'm just going to, we're just going to turn to the scriptures. I might make a few comments, but, but it's there. And we know what it means. I'm not going to waste your time spouting off and, and making things longer than they have to be. First of all, it's a partnership. Go to Genesis 2, and you'll find that Mark 10 quotes Genesis 2, but we'll, we'll go back there for this part. It's a partnership. Look at, let's read verse 18 to 23 of Genesis chapter 2. I thought I wasn't going to have to do this lesson after Dick's Lord's Supper. He says, everything was perfect. One man and his wife, you know, and then good, good thoughts, uh, Dick. But that, that, it was. Verse 18 of chapter 20, uh, chapter 2, sorry. Then the Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Even bearing in mind the relationship that God would have with man in the garden, Dick mentioned it, could walk and talk in the cool of day. Chap look at chapter 3, look at chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Dick had us there uh, the over Lord's Tupper. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid. God and man just walking in the garden and talking. Perfect. Great relationship. But even with that relationship in mind, God still saw that the man needed what he called a helper. In chapter 2, verse 18. And not only did God see the need for this relationship, 
I've never noticed this before. But I've noticed it. I never thought about it before. And if somehow it just means more to me just now, uh, or in this today. He made it a relationship like no other. Because every other created thing was made from the dust of the earth. Apart from the woman. I had never thought about that. Woman is the only created being not made from the dust of the earth. All the animals. Do you see he said that? Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 19. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field. Out of the ground. But then you go to verse 22, and he forms the woman out of the rib of the man. And for some reason, when I read that for this lesson, I just thought, that, that's fantastic. This is a relationship, according to God's design, this is a relationship like no other. Let's go back to Mark, Mark chapter 10. Keep a mark on Genesis 2. Okay, look at verse 6. So we've got this unique relationship that God has designed in tandem with the relationship with God. But this helper that he sees man needs. Well, look what it says in chapter 10, verse 6. And you see why I'm not going to say a lot about this, because this shouldn't need to be said in here, but it, it needs to be said outside. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Okay, so if we're talking about God's grand design, we know this, guess what? It's male and female. That's how he designed it. Everything else is just a corruption. That's the original design. See that what he said in verse 6? From the beginning. That's the original design. Anything else over and above or beyond that or different from that, that's not the design. That's a fake. That's where the design's not been followed. Something's going to go wrong with that. Just actually come into my head. You, you know that I like the program Everybody Loves Raymond. And one of the series, one of the series Raymond's building an outdoor uh, play, shoot, and climbing thing. It's got big plastic blocks and you fit it all together and the kids can climb in it and slide down the chute. Well, he's reading the instructions and he's, well, like a man, he's kind of half reading the instructions and he's trying to put this together as quick as he can and he's getting in a mess. And the final part is, this is just the, the intro to the, the, the program, the final part of it, you see him and he's trapped inside it and it's all put together like mangled. It does, there's no shape or form whatsoever and it's all locked together and he's shouting out, Deborah! Get my father, I'm, I'm hyperventilating because he's trapped in the thing. Because you know what, he didn't follow the design. Things go wrong when you don't follow the design. Well, God made it male and female from the beginning. It's also, it's not, not only just male and female, it's according to God's design, that is the perfect design for us and for this relationship. Go back to Genesis 2. Genesis 2, this time... Let's go to uh, verse 18 again. We've already read it. Let's read it again. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Fit for him. Some of the other translations have got good words. Can you put that up there, Graham? Uh, look at the, the, the amplified version. It says, I will make him a helper who balances him. New American Standard Version or Bible says, I will make a helper suitable for him. New Living Translation says, I will make a helper just right for him. And then the Common English Bible says, I will make a helper perfect for him. This is the perfect design that God has, has put in place here. It's, it's a partnership and the perfect one between a man and a woman. If we follow the design. Secondly, it's, a, it's about a commitment. Look at, uh, we're still in Genesis 2, look at verse 24. We didn't read this verse. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and, his, and, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. There's a leaving of one relationship to go to another here. There's a, a leaving, in a sense, physically at least, of the, of the parental relationship and what, what we say, prioritizing 
the wife relationship. At that point, we're saying, this is now the most significant relationship in my life. So, so there's a prioritizing there to be done. And once that prioritizing is done, he says in verse 24, there's a holding fast to be done. Well, I don't need to say too much about that. There is, there is a seriousness and a permanence about the commitment that's to be made in marriage. It's a partnership between a man and a woman, and it's just to be that, that relationship is to be prioritized seriously with a commitment. All right. Thirdly, there's intimacy. Let's go back to Mark chapter 10. Intimacy. Uh, let's read verse 8. Mark chapter 10, verse 8. And the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. The two become one flesh. God's design for marriage includes sexual fulfillment. That is where sexual desires have to, be, have to be fulfilled. It's in the marriage. This can't be clearer. Marriage, from the beginning, is the setting where sexual fulfillment takes place. You think I'm going... Jumping too far with that, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. If you think I'm assuming too much, this should, this should convince you. Matthew chapter, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. Let, let's, let's go back to verse 8. To the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to remain single as I am. But... If they cannot exercise self-control sexually, they should marry. Why? For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. In other words, there's good things about staying single. But do you know what? If you have sexual desires that you can't control, you need to get married. Because you are not allowed to fulfill them outside the marriage. Okay, that's the only setting where that can be done. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Have you seen a wee bit more about this one because it's such a problem in the world today? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Uh, let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. Let the marriage bed be undefiled. It's only the marriage bed that is described in Scripture as undefiled. The other beds out with marriage are defiled. Keep the married one undefiled. And then lastly, I told you you wouldn't be elaborating on this too much. It's sacred. According to God's design, marriage is sacred. Go back to Mark 10. Look at verse 9 again. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. There's a God union going on here. A man and a woman get married. It is God that joins them together as husband and wife, whether they believe it or not. Whether they even believe in God or not. He's gate crashing that way, then he's joining them as husband and wife, and they don't even know it. The minister, the celebrant, Graham will, Graham will back me up, I'm sure. We, I've met a few wedding celebrants who think the day is all about them. <laughs> they just think they are the bee's knees, and some of the photographers aren't much better. It's not. It's about the couple being joined together by the celebrant is incidental. It doesn't even matter. I mean, pick someone you like, but God's the important one here who's joining this couple together, whether they believe it or not. And then look how serious he gets with it in verse 9. Let no man separate. Don't mess with what God has joined together. Don't mess with 
God's design for marriage. Don't mess with God's institution of marriage, which has been there from the beginning. Don't try and change it. Don't try and interfere it. Don't interfere with it. Don't try and break it up in any way. Do not get involved with hindering or hampering or damaging what God has joined together in marriage. It sounds like quite a severe warning. What God has joined together, you can almost see the finger pointing. What God has joined together, let no man separate or beware, it almost sounds like. We've got to finish up going to Ephesians 5. Just, uh, we don't even have to comment, but we have to read it if we're talking about God's design for marriage and we're talking about it in the context of being uh, sacred. Ephesians chapter 5, uh, Let's just read the whole bit from 22 to 29. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Look at, look at this comparison, his body, and as himself its saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor. Look at the excitement and the passion here. Without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blame, blemish. In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own body, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Let's just go on to verse 33. Because we are members of his body, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, Genesis 2 again, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ in the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects the husband. What a sacred comparison. God's design for marriage illustrated, epitomized, perfected in the relationship that Christ has or wants or died to have with his church. What a sacred comparison for marriage. Something that people throw away like it means nothing these days. Let's go back to Mark 10. Let's just read the passage again. This is the design from the beginning. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they, are, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. When we're talking about God's grand design for marriage, God's there at the beginning. He's there at the end. And I'll tell you what, you better have them right there in the center if you want your marriage to be what it can be and what it's meant to be, what he designed it to be. Let's finish up back in Genesis 2. Let's just read verse 18 again. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. You know, I like that verse since I studied for this. You want to know how much marriage means to God? You want to know, you want to know how important the design for marriage is to God? Think about it. It was his very first idea after creation. It was his very first thought. His very first idea after he'd created out the, everything out of the dust of the earth. That's, this is what he thought about that first husband and wife. 
and making it perfect. And he designed it to be a partnership, to be other-centered in a me-centered world. Everybody's me, me, me. He designs marriage to be, well, you look after this other one. You put the interests of, you put the interests and the, the needs of this other one before even yourself. That's different. That's God. That's God designed that is. We wouldn't come up with something like that. And he designed it to be a serious and permanent commitment. And he designed it to be into an intimate and exclusive relationship. And he designed it to be sacred. He designed it, he designed it to reflect everything that is divine about him. His grace, his sacrifice, his honor, his truth, his passion, and his unending and unconditional love. Most marriages these days follow a vastly inferior pattern, a vastly inferior design. But if you can grasp God's de de design and build your marriage on that foundation, now we know when couples get married and they drive off in the car and, it, and they've got a sign on the back, what does it say? Just married. And, you know, on that day, it means I've just been married. I'll tell you what, for most marriages, they should probably just leave that sign up in their living room because they're just married. That's it. They're just, well, they're just married. But if you can grasp God's design, you won't just be married. You'll be happily married. God bless. next song will be song 508, A Wonderful Saviour. Song 508. A wonderful saviour is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful saviour to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, he taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up, and I shall not be moved, he giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. With numberless blessings each moment he crowns, and filled with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for <coughs> as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. 
When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. If I was a single today, I think I would try to get married. Adam, thank you very much. That was a perfect lesson. I mean, it makes a lot more meaning to me why I grabbed Felicia to myself. Because it's such a perfect design for me. Thank you so much. There are two guys walking on a path and the path is so narrow and it was bushy and it has rained heavily that is they went after the rain so all the you know the rain water was on that uh, bushes around the path so it's just a narrow path, so you can't go side by side, just one have to lead. And these two guys, one was so, you know, cunning guy that uh, he didn't want to wet himself. So in order not to wet himself, he has to let the other guy lead first, so that uh, he will just get all the work, and he will follow him. And that guy also devised a plan he had two coins in his pocket. So he said, you go first and I'll follow you. Why me? Because you are the youngest, you have to go. So okay. So as they were going, this guy had two uh, pound coins in his pocket. So he just go along the road and he throw the coin on the ground without the guy noticing it. And then he uh, go a few steps and say, oh, I'll grab a coin on the floor, then he takes it. And they go just a few years through another. And then I've got a queen. So he did that for several times and the guy following him, that, why am I not getting any queen? Okay, this time I am going to lead. You follow me. The guy said, why? Is it because I'm grabbing the queen? No, no. Now, now I'm the oldest, so I want you to follow me. So, okay. And this guy, and that was about, you know, uh, to taste of the, 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 the road left to go, uh, that bushy road. So this guy went and went and went and went, and he grabbed nothing. And then he turned to that uh, the one behind me said, why am I not getting anything from the ground? He said, you know what? You only grab it when you throw it. And that is the same as given. If you don't throw it away, you don't get it. You see, Solomon said something in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24 to 25. And this is what he stirred. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, 
and one who waters will himself be watered. Proverbs eleven twenty four. Do you believe this? Do you believe that? Now, these are all the assurances in the Bible. Right. And Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. You see, this observation by Solomon applies to all humans, all people. It doesn't matter whether you are Christian or not. It doesn't matter whether you are atheist or are Muslim or Buddhist or whatever. If you freely give, you'll get it back. And that is what this is, is talking about. So then say, oh, this, because this is in a Christian Bible, so he's talking to, uh, it applies to only Christian. No, it doesn't work that way. Even if you are not a Christian and you freely give, you grow richer. That's what this implies. But you know what? Sometimes people who downgrade themselves as poor people do not have that kind of courage to put this into test. Because we always crumble and say that we don't have enough. Why should we give? And even if they will give, I don't want to calculate how much you give to God. That is not <laughs> my way to do it. But even if they will give, man, if I was God, I'd say, guy, what are you doing to me? You see, if we are able to put proverbs, you know, assurance given to us into test, then we will see that indeed you only grasp it when you throw it away. And if you don't throw it, you will wet yourself in all these bushy roads, getting nothing because you don't want to give it out. So you don't take it. Now, we do not have that kind of courage, the poor widow had by giving all the rest of all he had into the play. Mark chapter 12, verse 41 to 42. This poor widow, sometimes the interpretation we give to the scenario doesn't match. People say, oh, it doesn't matter how, you, how much you give. See, this widow gives little thing, but God bless him. That's not what is implies. She gave everything that he had. She had everything that she had. And that is what she gave. Probably if it was you and I, we would say that, oh, we don't have, well, we have only two pounds in our pocket. I mean, that can buy bread from Morrison's. So why should I give it? But this lady, without thinking of what he, she is going to have tonight, still gave it, still gave it. So it is true that God have blessings for us. And not only for us, but for any human being who put this to test, by giving freely, you will receive it back. It's not only in the collection plate. In all your life, please try to put this to a test. Give it freely and you receive freely. Now, for us Christians, we should understand it more even than those who are not Christians. In that case, we should be wanting anything at all in the church. We are sitting here, our preachers who are preaching to us depend on foreign people to help them survive. We should have been able to take care of our own preachers without them going to America to get help. Because we don't put this to test. God said, if you give freely, you shall not want and you will get it back. Jesus is not saying the, you know, the amount that you give is the same that you are going to give him. He said, you're going to receive it pressed down. Okay? You put it back and pressed down for you. 
let us understand all these kind of assurances that the scripture gives to us and put it to test. Then we'll say, if we shall need anything at all. God bless you. If you are listening to me now, let's try and see. Shall we pray? Father God Almighty, we thank you so much that we have a family like this that we can gather and you speak to us. We thank you so much for the wonderful lesson that we had today. It is about time that we have to show our love. There are so many assurances in the Bible, but God, we fail to put them to test. Probably we think that, oh, you are not talking to me, talking to someone else. Let us read the Bible and apply it to our lives than to think that you are speaking to some people so that the blessing that we have to enjoy in giving, we will receive it. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Final song today will be song 648, 648. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. And you might have guessed by now, but we'll stand for this. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, for Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Ye that are men now serve him, Against unnumbered foes, let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, and watching unto prayer, where duty calls or danger. Be never wanting there. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle. The next the victor song. To him that overcometh, a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. Please be seated. Afternoon, church. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Lord our God, we hope that our service to you today was satisfactory. 
We pray that today's scripture reading will strengthen our faith in you. We pray that we can find courage to depart the word out into the world to people that don't know you. Lord God, as you know, before we start to administer your word, you want us to make sure that we are righteous. The first thing that we need to do, that you want us to do, is to take the log out of our own eyes before I can take the speck out of the eyes of the one that God is trying to save through working through us. How do we strengthen our faith in you? Lord God, you want us to follow, follow the one that leads. Follow, follow the one that loves. Follow, follow the one that cares. Follow, follow the almighty God from now to eternity. We ask you to constantly keep us in check so that you can do what you want us to do. So that you're working through us to bring souls into salvation. In the glorious name of your Son, the Lord Jesus, we ask you to keep checking and to strengthen our faith. Amen. Amen.